Alright, today we will, we will be discussing active faults. Let's start with the definitions. An active fault is a fault that can generate earthquakes. And also included in the active faults are the trenches, which are the tectonic trenches and they should not be confused with the act of digging faults which is confusingly called trenching all right now trenches are huge structures and technically they're they are also active faults now for active versus inactive faults as per fevox and as per USGS, active faults are ones that have that that have activities which were present in the last ten thousand years. So its last activity should be at most ten thousand years old or younger to be considered it for a fault to be considered active. Okay, so if the fault's activity is more than 10,000 years, then we can consider it as an inactive fault, which cannot produce earthquakes, statistically speaking. An important principle for active faults is the cross-cutting principle. As we can see here, we have a fault that is cutting through a strata and they have offset here the entire thickness and suppose this strata contains a holocene sediment then we can conclude that this fault is active and then we have another fault here that let's say does not cut through our holocene sediments then we can say that this fault is older than Holocene and therefore an inactive fault. Now, studying active faults uh, require a lot of effort and typically they are done by institutions who have the know-how and the funding to undertake these kind of studies. So let's discuss the case studies involving uh, mapping and studying of uh, active faults. Okay. And I have three examples here. A okay, one is uh, for regional mapping and then detailed mapping and then detailed fault characterization. For regional mapping, uh, my example here is the study of Tsutsumi and Perez in 2013, which provided basis for the active faults mapping of Evox. All right, and this study uh, used extensively satellite imagery to narrow down areas with lineaments. And then these lineament areas were further studied using satellite, uh, rather or rather stereoscopic aerial photographs. Now you might say that aerial photographs are an old technology, but actually air photos, all right, uh, especially the film air photos, are high resolution images. I mean they. Uh, film photos are actually superior to digital photos. Okay, if you would convert them to megapixels, they 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 exceed, they they, they typically exceed the resolution of our digital cameras. And the advantage of stereosco stereoscopic air photos it, is that you can see the three D image of an area. And three D. And a 3D perspective is quite important in fault studies, all right, as most of the features in fault studies are 3D. Uh, anyway, in this 
in this mapping or in this study, they have uh, two main categories for active faults. First is the active fault, which is defined as a fault trace which intersects surfaces or deposits with late quaternary or Holocene age. So therefore, as long as the fault trace is intersecting our or is intersecting recent deposits, it is uh, classified as an active fault. Now we also have presumed active faults, which are faults that are intersecting bedrock. Okay. Now note uh, these classifications are also based on field field studies. Okay, so they also did field verification studies in order to validate their initial classifications of the faults. Another study here is the study of Rimando and uh, Nupfer. This is a regional to detailed scale mapping. And their study focuses on the Marikina Fault Valley System or the MVFS. Note back in the days uh, that was Marikina Valley Fault Twist System was the original name of the fault system. But of course, for political purposes, I mean, to appease everyone, to keep everyone happy, rather than name it as Marikina Fault System or Metro Manila Fault System, which should have been the most appropriate for me, I think, they just named it as valley fault system all right but but in reality this fault can destroy <coughs> the whole metro manila okay um estimates of casualties from a big earthquake from the valley fault system uh, put put in a minimum of 50,000 50, death, deaths for the metro manila minimum 50,000 Alright, so Remando and Nufer, what they did was they did air photo and field mapping. And they also used stereo air photo to measure fault offsets. Okay. I think the modern equivalent of this is to use uh, LiDAR, which can provide really high resolution elevation, and from there you can probably you can get a good estimate of fault offsets. And they also estimated the earthquake magnitude from correlation uh, of displacements with magnitude. So re they relied heavily here on the study of Wilson Coppersmith. And this is this is an example, or this is a, an excerpt from the study showing their geologic mapping of the area. And this shows a lot of geomorphic features like offset streams, terraces, spurs, all right, scarp, triangular facets, all right, hanging valleys, saddles, and so on. And the third and last study or case study here is from the Pascal, Chandler Yates, uh, me, <laughs> Wilson, me, Twist, Cheng. So this, uh, this was a study done by my project team members and I was still studying Masters of Engineering Geology in New Zealand. And this study started as a project, right? It, it was just a mini project for a for a subject in our engineering geology course. And then eventually Chandler Leeds, one of my classmates, expounded this as his thesis and published a paper on the on this fault. Okay, so this fault is the Southwestland Fault Zone. Alright, so this so this was a previously uh, uncharacterized and unmapped fault in New Zealand. Okay, uh, De Pascal or Gregory De, De Pascal initially found it on a river. It was a river cut 
Libertary Scott. And then he deferred the study for us to uh, pursue. So he introduced the area to us. So we pursued the study. And what we did here is stereo air photo mapping, of course, for geomorphological mapping. And then we did some field mapping to confirm the cross cutting relations of the geomorph geomorph geomorphologic units. This was quite nerve wracking for me in the sense that the area involved glacial till deposits or glacial deposits, which I only heard from uh, lectures, but I never had an opportunity to study them in person and it was my first time studying glacial deposits all right uh, included in the study of course are sketches of fault features and outcrops so we were actually lucky here because the fault exposure was just on on the river channel so we didn't we did not have to do trenching which is expensive and time consuming so all we had to do back then was do, was just to observe the outcrop of the fault feature, sketch it, and do some measurements. Okay. And what was important in the study, of course, was the fault in orientation, okay, the strike and dip attitude, as well as the cross-cutting principles, because we were also interested in the uh, amount of fault slip involved in each uh, fault event. Okay. Uh, our estimate back then was that the fault had at least uh, three uh, three main events. Okay. And we were able to estimate the displacement for each event using cross-cutting relations. And finally, uh, Chandler Yates did uh, took the study further by doing an absolute dating of the fault. What he did was to take samples of the faulted material and used a method called optically stimulated luminescence or OSL for quartz. What this uh, method does is is that or the idea here is that quartz grains can record the last time they saw light okay so quartz uh can can sort of record in their in their greens okay when was the last time they were exposed to light so probably the last time the quartz greens saw light was uh, somewhere near somewhere or sometime before it was faulted Okay. And yeah, and that was basically the whole uh, de that is the overview of the study. If you want to see the details, uh, the paper is in here. Okay. Active tectonics, west of New Zealand's Alpine Fault, Southwestern Fault Zone activity shows a certain plate instability. Now, this is the photo of the site. All right. And trying to see where the fault was. All right, approximately this is the fault. Okay, the fault was approximately here. Oh, sorry. Actually, if you would see, this is this unit is the old man gravel. OMG. And you have your e snag. All right. Okay, so the fault is somewhere in. Uh, it's quite hard to trace due to the resolution, but the fault is somewhere, approximate somewhere in here. Okay. And yeah, basically, uh, I wish I had a more high resolution photo of the site. But basically, that was the uh, 
this is the fault area and all we had to do back then was just uh, look at the strata and uh, make sense of the displacement that occurred in the fault okay and this is the location of the southwestern fault it is located in the south island of New Zealand okay and uh, Chandler Leeds uh, later associated the fault with the Alpine Fault. Okay, so Alpine Fault, all right, is it's like the Philippine Fault Zone of of New Zealand. It's a long fault, like exceeding thousands of a thousand kilometer length. Okay, all right. Now let's proceed to the geomorphic indicators. All right, so there are a lot actually, in the, actually a lot of indicators of fault activity. So you can rely on movement records like from seismographs or from written or historical or oral accounts. You can also look at geomorphology. All right, like. Although the problem with geomorphology is you have to have a good um, info or good description of the possible age of that geomorphic feature, otherwise it's it would be quite difficult to conclude if the geomorphological feature is actually indicative of an active fault or was it just an old. Uh, old uh, movement from an inactive fault and another problem with geomorphic indicators is that they are not mutually exclusive with other phenomenon all right so not some indicators are often not unique to a fault activity so for example groundwater extraction in metro manila okay uh, some of the uh, features of subsidence in Metro Manila was initially associated with fault movement. All right, but there are also uh, contrasting studies that conclude that the subsidence in parts of Metro Manila was actually just due to uh, groundwater extraction or even just a regional subsidence of compressing sediment sediments okay so uh, it's it's not always a straightforward indicator all right uh, for further reading uh, I'd suggest the book of Burbank and Anders Anderson which is tectonic geomorphology for the concepts although for practical stuff uh, the old gold here is the book of Benzoidum which is terrain analysis and classification using aerial photographs okay, uh, this is a very very rare book and it's actually a really good book on geomorphology okay? even if you don't intend to use aerial photographs uh, you can still learn a lot from this book now geomorph geomorphic indicators so you have scarps all right scarps are just features that are caused by by vertical offsets okay so we have a vertical offset here I suck in drawing. Nah, it's not right. Ah, I give up. I'll just uh, discuss it with an actual figure. Other features are offset or offset channels or, st or streams. All right. Other features are offset channels or streams, which can be caused by vertical or horizontal offsets. 
You also have sag pods which are created by tension as well as linear ridges. Sorry, linear ridges are uh, are caused by compression. Okay, so they're caused by compression. And another important stuff in geomorphic indicators is the act is the age of the geomorphic indicator. So it has to be constrained by cross-cutting relations with other geomorphic features. And then, if possible, date it. Do some absolute dating before we conclude whether the indicator is indicating an active fault or is just is it just indicating an inactive fault. Now, this is an example of this is a block diagram showing various uh, geomorphic indicators. Okay, so you have uh, linear valleys in here, so more or less uh, straight line valleys. You also have a scarp. Okay, so what happened here is this this block moved downward. Okay, you have a relatively relative downward movement. And this is sort of the scar or the or the wound of your your ground. Okay. That's your scarp. And of course when this part goes up, alright, it's possible that its groundwater line was also disrupted. So it's possible for this groundwater line to to be exposed, alright, so it can uh, result in formation of springs. Okay, so what happened is, for example, this is your original ground, and that's your groundwater, and then you had a fault displacement, so, alright, so this block moved upward, this block moved downward. And your groundwater is in here. So naturally, this groundwater will sort of continue somewhere in here. And that will result in a spring. Alright. What else? So you have a sag pond. Sag pond is formed by transtension. And I'll just discuss it later. And you also have linear ridges. Uh, it's not so clear in here. And you also have an offset drainage channel. So this was originally going here. But it was offset in this part. You had an offset here. Alright. This is a good example of a fault scarp. Or, okay, which is also called a ground rupture. Or which can be due to ground, which is typically due to ground rupture. Okay, so ground, ground rupture is a surface ex expression of fault displacement. Alright, so you have the scarp in here. Uh, this is from Bohol. Okay. Nice uh, fault scarp. Alright, in the context of earthquake engineering, alright, uh, ground ruptures are technically the least deadly uh, fault hazards because, I mean, they're actually scary. I mean, look, I mean, they're, it's like the, the hell is opening. But uh, ground ruptures actually have a very limited uh, geographical distribution. Okay, they only occur near the fault. Alright. Unlike uh, liquefaction, which occurs over a large area, I mean, typically within 200 kilometers radius from a, of a large fault, such as what happened in Pangasinan during the Luzon earthquake. Uh, what else? You also have your ground shaking, which also affects a large area, as well as landslides, landslides which can cut off road networks. Okay. 
uh, the problem with uh, with seismic hazards is not the sheer uh, devastation caused by the earthquake itself, but rather a problem is the widespread uh, effect of the of the earthquake, and it can disrupt a lot of networks like road networks, uh, water connections, electrical connections. Uh, which can easily exacerbate the effects of faults to the afflicted residents. Alright, now uh, this is an example of a sag pond. And it occurs in stepping faults. And the pond will form in the area of transtension. So this is a stepping fault. So this is a stepping fault that steps here, all right. And what happened is you had a yeah you had relatively relative movement, all right. That opened or had that exerted a transtension in this step. Okay, so as an effect, this part uh, opened, so this part sort of rifted, and and formed a sag pond. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, my bad. Actually, this is a. Quite tricky, but all right. So let's just, just look at this uh, map view. All right. So what happened here is you had a step in here. All right, and the fault move to the left, okay, and this caused an opening in this really in this bend. So you have a releasing bend in here, which created a pull apart basin and as well as sag ponds. And then the fault also had another step in here, and the relative movement on the other hand caused a compression which resulted in a pressure ridge okay so this other photo here or satellite image here is just an example of a sag pond right now we also have linear ridges which are common in strike step faults so this is your linear ridge in here okay and this is a strike step fault Now let's talk about estimation of earthquake magnitude. So you can, as discussed earlier, you can rely on stratigraphy and cross-cutting relations. And uh, this study essentially just shows one, two, three, four, five events. Okay. And this is quite tricky in a sense that you have to find the youngest event and then this is tricky in a sense that events can cause uh, different events can occur in a single fault trace alright so it's possible to have just a single fault but and the movement is actually a a result of multiple events okay so if you're not aware of the multiple events you can uh, end up uh, overestimating the actual displacement per event of that fault so for example you had a fault which had a displacement of five meters 
and you interpreted it as a single event. Okay? So, single event, 5 meters, I mean, that's a huge uh, earthquake. But in reality, the fault or the displacement that you have measured might be a product of 5 individual events or 2, which will result in a smaller displacement per event, which correlates to uh, smaller magnitude earthquakes. Okay? Another uh, method here for estimating uh, earthquake magnitude is from historical records, and this is a good example of uh, estimation of magnitudes from pre-instrumentation pre pre histo historical records. Meaning, this uh, they estimated magnitude of, of earthquakes without uh, data on uh, without seismic in the absence of accelerogram data so what they did uh, Mam Bautista and uh, Oike what they did is they compiled accounts of earthquakes from Spanish church records which goes from 1589 to 1895 so that's a long that's a long ass record and then what they did is they estimated magnitudes from the descriptions of church dam church damage and descriptions of uh, other phenomena like landslides, ground shaking, uh, liquefaction. And it's important to note it's important to note that the churches in the Spanish times are not the sissy churches that we have uh, nowadays. The churches in the Spanish times also served as fortifications okay so they were technically fortresses that protected the residents from uh, from pirates from natural calamities and so on okay if you want to see a uh, really heavily fortified churches you can go to Ilocos I mean, they have plenty of uh, heavily fortified churches in there. But anyway, uh, what I am trying to say here is that you need uh, really, really large earthquakes back then to damage a, a Spanish-era church. Okay, so that was one of the good one of the good indicators they used to estimate the magnitude of earthquakes. All right. Now, they also located the earthquakes based on triangulation from similar descriptions. Uh, so they looked for uh, same descrip uh, descriptions of earthquakes in different areas, pointing to a single date. Okay, so they looked for uh, descriptions of earthquakes in different areas but had the same date and from there uh, they were able to triangulate the location of that earthquake so as a result they were able to extend the Philippine earthquake record to 400 years okay so it for me it, it, it's a large feat and uh, uh, the study is quite uh, useful for uh, I, per, I, per, I Personally, refer it for uh, for special studies of um, seism seismic studies. Okay, uh, it's a good reference even for engineering studies. Okay, so if you really want a good uh, uh, record of the historically large earthquakes in an area, okay, uh, this paper stretches four hundred years to our earthquake records and they're really useful they have look coordinates and magnitudes for uh, historical earthquakes in the Philippines we also have seismograph records and USGS has an earthquake catalog which is a worldwide database from 19 
from the start of nine, from the 20th century to present. And this it's a useful catalog for seismic studies, like for engineering design and reports. Although my disclaimer here is that USGS relies on news to estimate earthquake event parameters such as structure displacement. Alright, so compared to Fevox, alright, Fevox has a as a ready access to earthquake aftermaths. I mean, every time there's a big earthquake, you can expect Fevox to be there. I mean, within a few days, and they they will readily uh, visit the site, uh, make measurements, and I would personally trust uh, the the numbers uh, given by Fevox in ter okay, when we're talking about earthquake magnitudes over USGS. But of course for for a ready reference here's just a I'm just showing here the interface of the USGS catalog. So you can select uh, the magnitude that you want. So if you're interested in big earthquakes I'd say you, you go for a minimum of six also set the date and time so the record can go as early as uh, the start of 20th century you can also constrain the region all right or you can just input your site location okay so lat long and then set the radius of uh, your reckoning uh, typically, 200 kilometers is sufficient for most uh, seismic design, although uh, there are special cases where, where 200 kilometers is not enough. And I'll, we'll just discuss that later in this course. Alright, so thanks for listening. These are the references. So, Paper of Bautista, Book of Anderson and Burbank. And then our paper, paper of Rimando, paper of Tsutsumi and Perez, and as well as the book of Van Zuidam. Alright?